Well, I think most of us would agree that financial integrity is one of the most important aspects of any godly ministry. And yet, time and time again, we hear of scandals in churches and ministries related to money. Many years ago, uh, I went to a church as a senior pastor, and I discovered that the church secretary was in charge of the finances. She was the bookkeeper and the one who not only wrote the checks, but signed the checks. After I had been there a while, I started asking some questions about how things were being done and ultimately uncovered some serious problems. Although she was in charge of the church's accounting, she had not produced any reports for over two years. The church had not had any audits of any kind. And then I started noticing some strange behavior. I noticed that she would wait for the mailman to come and then she would rush outside to meet him instead of waiting for him to put the mail in the box. Eventually, we secured records from the bank and discovered that she had been embezzling funds from the church for a long time. When this was discovered, she and her husband immediately moved to another state. Her husband was a deacon, and they had been in that church for years, but no one knew what was going on with the money. Of course, this has no doubt been repeated in many, many churches. But it is important for the church to maintain integrity in this critical area. No one should have to wonder if they can trust the church when it comes to giving and finances. And when we <clears throat> support missionaries, we need to make sure that we can trust that they are godly and that they also have integrity. You know, we've received many requests for support down through the years. And my first question is always, who is this that is asking for the support? Do we trust them theologically? Do we trust them to be godly men of integrity? <clears throat> now, why do we ask that? <clears throat> because we want to support ministries that are like-hearted doctrinally and are people of integrity in regard to how they conduct their work. And to the best of our ability, we want to know that if we send money to them, it is being used the way it should be. All of us have seen abuses in this area of finances. There have always been charlatans out there who take advantage of people and extort millions of dollars in the name of the Lord. And this makes us a little gun shy when it comes to giving. John MacArthur tells about a time when he was in Kiev and he noticed a camera crew going around taking pictures of poverty stricken areas. And they were Americans and so he asked them what they were doing. One guy said, oh, we're just taking pictures. MacArthur said, well, I can see that, but why are you taking pictures of the poor conditions of these people? And he said, we can take this back to America and show it on TV and it will bring in about $5 million. There was no legitimate ministry to these people. It was just a way to raise money. They were deceiving people into believing that they were meeting the needs of these poor people, but they were just using the dire conditions to pull at people's heartstrings and fill their coffers. This kind of, things ha ha kind of thing happens all the time. But listen, we have to make sure that we are not guilty of that kind of thing. And we must be above board 
when it comes to how we handle money in the church. It is dishonoring to Christ when we don't have financial integrity. Well, the passage we're dealing with today focuses on this very thing. It has to do with maintaining integrity in financial matters. And really what Paul is doing in this section of chapter 8 is dealing with certain criticisms that he anticipated might come up. And Paul does this in many places. But here he is anticipating that someone might say, well, you know Paul, he's a one-man show. He goes all over the world and everywhere he goes, he takes up money. I wonder how he is benefiting from that. He doesn't seem to answer to anybody. So how do we know if we can trust him? And remember, even though he has been reconciled with the majority of the church at Corinth, there are still some pockets of critics. There was still a pocket of people who were anti-Paul. You know, we have never Trumpers in our day and time, but they had never Pauls. And they were no doubt looking for some opportunity to say, see, I told you we never should have trusted this guy. And that's why financial integrity is so critical in the matter of the offering that Paul's taking. And we're going to see here some important principles for maintaining financial integrity in any ministry. And we're going to take this in three parts. But the middle one will be the one we'll spend the most time on. We're going to see the integrity of pastoral leadership, integrity through precautions and limitations, and integrity through proof of love. So that's our outline. And we begin with integrity of pastoral leadership. Financial leadership in the church always begins with pastoral leadership. And we see that very clearly here. Look with me at verses 16 and 17. But thanks be to God who puts the same earnestness on your behalf in the heart of Titus. For he not only accepted our appeal, but being himself very earnest, he has gone to you of his own accord. Now what's this saying here? <clears throat> it's saying that Titus is fully on board with this offering. We have an affirmation from Titus, and Titus was someone they knew and trusted. He was someone most of them could really relate to. You know, Paul was seen by most of them as kind of being bigger than life as the Lord's apostle, but Titus was probably someone they could relate to more easily. And yes, we do see Titus going to the island of Creed and setting the church in order there as we have been seeing on Sunday nights. So we know he was a leader, but he seems to be portrayed more as a servant leader, and this is something that has endeared him to the Corinthians. So what Paul is saying here is Titus is in agreement with the plan. He is supportive of the offering. And this is important because he wanted to... He wanted them to know that what he was doing was not just some kind of one-man effort. He wants them to know that Titus also has a heart for this as well. And remember now, they knew Titus well. He is the one who had delivered all these letters from Paul. And they loved him. I mean, go back to chapter 7 and verse 15 for a moment. Remember this? And his 
affection abounds all the more toward you as he remembers the obedience of you all, how you received him with fear and trembling. Titus had a deep affection for the Corinthians, and they had received him with fear and trembling. They had much respect for him. The Greek word that's used there means honor or respect. They believed he was a man of God, and they knew he loved them. And remember, Titus was the one who had first talked to them about this offering. He is the one who had introduced it to them and urged them to start collecting it. And so this is important for them to understand that he is fully on board with this. But go back to chapter 8, verse 16 again. But thanks be to God who puts the same earnestness on your behalf in the heart of Titus. Titus had the same heart about this as Paul did. And by the way, notice a theological truth here. This tells us that God works in people's hearts. This implies that God had changed Titus's heart and that he had put the same earnestness in his heart as was in the heart of Paul. Does God move in people's hearts? Of course he does. And this should be an encouragement to us that we never give up on anyone, but that we pray that God will do a work in their heart and change them to conform them to his will. God is in the business of changing hearts. And this is important because we often get frustrated with people and, and we may start to think that their heart will never change. But we always need to maintain hope that God will do a work in their hearts and change them in his time and in his way. This is what happened here. God did a work in Titus's heart and he put the same kind of zeal for this offering in his heart as was in the Apostle Paul's. And notice the wording here. But thanks be to God who puts the same earnestness on your behalf in the heart of Titus. He put the earnestness there. The word is spude. It means zeal or passion. Not only was Titus in support of this offering, he had a zeal for it. He had a passion for it. His earnestness matched that of Paul. And remember this, Paul was a Jew, but Titus was a what? A Gentile. This is important because now they can't say, well, Paul is just trying to help out his Jewish friends at our expense. No, Titus is fully behind this thing as well. And this strengthens the whole enterprise and allays many doubts. And look at verse 17, where he not only accepted our appeal, but being himself very earnest, he has gone to you of his own accord. This was not a situation where Titus said, yes, sir, Paul, if this is what you want, then out of respect for you, I will go along with it. No, Titus is very earnest in this project. He believes in it strongly. So much so that he's going to go back to them and make sure it gets done. So what's the application for the church today? Well, the application is that we don't act unilaterally when we raise funds for anything in the church. It can't be a one-man show with some sort of charismatic leader using his domineering personality, personality to manipulate the giving. 
No, all the leadership has to be on board. You see, Paul was one of those rare people in history. He was an extremely strong leader. We would probably be right in saying that they don't come any stronger than Paul. And he could have exerted his larger-than-life personality, and he could have acted unilaterally in this, but he didn't do that. He understood that clearly perceived integrity was critical here. He had the force and the position to insist on this, but he didn't use that influence. No, he said, this is a team effort. This is more than just me. Titus is also earnest about this. And he's doing all this in a totally voluntary way. He is choosing to be a part of this. Now let me digress for a moment. But isn't it great when church leaders are in agreement? That's how it should be in the church. It never should be a situation where some of the leaders say, well, we're not fully on board with this, but we'll go along with it until something bad happens. You know, we'll just stand by and be quiet until something goes awry, and then we'll come out and say, I told you so, we never should have done this. Folks, Satan loves that kind of thing. That is the kind of thing that can destroy a church. But when there is full agreement and unanimity among the leadership, it can be such an encouragement to the church as a whole. And when God gives his leaders the heart of agreement, that is such a blessing, especially when it comes to financial matters. So we see the importance of having integrity among the pastoral leadership. But there's a second thing that we see here that is equally important, and that is integrity through precautions and limitations. And we see this in verses 18 to 23. Here's where we're going to spend the bulk of our time. In verse 18, we see another huge potential criticism and Paul's answer to it. The criticism is that Paul might misuse the money. And we're told in verse 20 that there is a lot of it. The word for generous in verse 20 implies a great deal of cash. This is a very large amount. It literally means an abundance and this is sometimes the case in the church. Three boys were on the playground bragging about how much money their fathers made. And one boy said, my dad is a lawyer. He can write a few words on a piece of paper and charge $150. Another one said, well, my dad's a doctor. He can hand write a prescription, and charge $200. The third one said, well, my dad's a preacher. He gets up and gives a brief talk, and it takes six men to take up the collection. Well, I don't know if they were making any jokes about Paul. Probably so. But he was anticipating a possible criticism. And remember, some had been trying to discredit him for quite some time. So in verse 18, he shows how the money is being handled. And he demonstrates that there are a number of precautions and limitations in place that ensure accountability and integrity. Look at verse 18. And we have sent along with him, that is with Titus, the brother whose fame in the things of the gospel has spread through all the churches. 
Now, we don't know who this guy is, but we know he is well known among the churches. Some people have guessed this could have been Tychicus or Trophimus or even Luke, but the truth is we don't know. He is unnamed. And by the way, he's probably not Luke because his gospel would not have been circulated before this time, so he likely would not be famous among the churches at this point. But the point is, we really don't know who this is. And all we need to know is that he was one whose fame in the things of the gospel had spread through all the churches. They knew him well. Paul didn't even have to give his name because they would have immediately known who he was. And more importantly is that this brother is going along with Titus to, make the, to take the offering to Jerusalem. So here's another layer of accountability. And in fact, it is likely that this man was a famous preacher of the gospel. He was known and esteemed by all the churches. Perhaps this was Apollos. We don't really know. But he was highly respected and unimpeachable brother who could be trusted. And he was sent to go with Titus to deliver this large amount of money to the saints in Jerusalem. It was likely another shepherd, another pastor, and that adds to the credibility of the whole enterprise. So it wasn't just Paul that was doing this, and it wasn't just Paul and Titus. Now there's another brother involved as well. And not only is he simply another person to provide more accountability, he is also a student of God's word. He is a godly man who is a proclaimer of the gospel. What's the application for us? Well, we need to put the care of the finances in the hands of the most trustworthy people. You want to make sure that the ones who are handling the money are those who are the most godly in character and the most knowledgeable in the word of God. This is why it was originally handled by the apostles. And then that responsibility passed on to the elders. You don't choose someone because they're good at money or because they work at a local bank. You choose them because they are people of high character and have knowledge of the truth. We'll go on to verse 19. And not only this, but he also has been appointed by the churches to travel with us in this gracious work. Stop right there. Notice it wasn't Paul's decision here. It wasn't even Titus's decision. It was the appointment of the churches. The churches were the ones who chose this guy. Why is that important? Well, it's important because someone might say, well, Paul and Titus are in collusion here and they just chose one of their buddies to tag along. That is not the case. This man has been appointed by the churches. This is not just Paul's man. You say, how did they choose this man? Well, we don't know. We're not told. We can't assume that they were congregational in their polity and therefore they took a vote. We don't know that. And by the way, here is something else that's really important. It was not that Paul could not be trusted, he could. It wasn't that Titus couldn't be trusted, he could. The problem was that the enemies of Paul could not be trusted. Those who wanted to destroy Paul could not be trusted. This was to protect 
Paul from false criticism. Paul had enemies, and they would have loved nothing better than to spread false accusations against him, claiming that he was doing all this to gain financially. So the extra layers of accountability are designed to head those kinds of rumors off. Look at verse 19 again. And not only this, but he has also been appointed by the churches to travel with us in this gracious work which is being administered by us. Paul is saying we're the ones who are administering this offering, but the churches have appointed someone to oversee this entire project. This will ensure its integrity. You don't want to allow for false accusations to tear down the work of the gospel. So Paul says this brother, this well-known gospel preacher has been appointed by the churches to travel with us in this gracious work. He's a permanent auditor, if you will. He's there the whole time from start to finish, and he's overseeing everything that takes place. Listen, folks, this is why we put safeguards in place here at Parker Bible Church. This is why we have audits. This is why we have different people counting the offerings and making the deposits. This is why the budgeting and spending is monitored by the elders. It's not that we don't trust the people involved with the finances. It's just that we don't ever want to have a situation where someone can hurl false accusations against us. And at the end of verse 19, Paul says, there's a twofold reason for this. For the glory of the Lord himself and to show our readiness. One of the main reasons why there must be integrity is because this is for the glory of the Lord. We don't want his name to be dishonored. We don't want any reproach to fall on Christ. We don't want any accusations that can stick because there's truth to them. If someone makes an accusation, we want to be able to show it is false. But that last phrase, to show our readiness, is a little more difficult. The word readiness is probably better rendered eagerness, but the question is, eagerness for what? Some have said it has to do with Paul's eagerness to help the poor saints in Jerusalem, which is no doubt very true. But I believe this has to do the, with the eagerness of Paul to have the kind of accountability necessary to ensure integrity. In other words, he was eager to have this other brother join them in the process because he knew this would add another layer of protection. We'll go on to verse 20. Taking precaution that no one should discredit us in our administration of this generous gift. He clearly states here, this is the goal. We want to take precautions so everyone will know this is all being done honestly. And again, it's here in verse 20 where we're told how large an offering this was. He calls it a generous gift, and he uses there a word that means a great abundance, a bounty. Now, we don't know how much that was, but it was a huge amount. And then in verse 21, he explains, for we have regard for what is honorable, not only in the sight of the Lord, but also in the sight of men. The word for honorable 
could be translated noble. We want this to be a noble thing that is honorable to the Lord. And notice it needs to be what is pleasing to the Lord, but also that which is seen as honorable in the sight of men. Someone might say, well, if it's pleasing to God, then why should we care what men think? Paul did. In fact, Paul would say, it really matters what men think. It it matters because there are enemies of the gospel and there are enemies of the truth and there are enemies of the church and so we need to do everything we can to head off any unjust criticism. Well, Paul was not done yet. He goes on in verse 22 and he says, and we have sent with them our brother. Wait a minute now. This is likely a different guy than the previous one mentioned. In verse 23, we're told that there are messengers, plural, from the churches. So this is probably a second guy that has also been appointed by them. And we don't have his name either, but he is somebody they all knew. And Paul describes him in some glowing terms, whom we have often tested and found diligent in many things. The word for tested there is the word dokimatsu. It's the word for being tested in the fire and proven to be genuine. And so so he's saying here, this man has been put through the fire. He's been tested. He's been proven to be a man of integrity. And he says he has been found diligent in many things, but now even more diligent because of his great confidence in you. He probably heard the great report from Titus about the reconciliation between the Corinthians and Paul. But here's a man who's diligent. He is passionate and zealous, and he's been proven, and now he is even more encouraged than ever before, so he wants also to be a part of this worthy endeavor. Well, Paul just kind of summarizes everything in verse 23. As for Titus, he is my partner and fellow worker among you. As for our brethren, they are messengers of the churches, a glory to Christ. It's like he's saying, okay, now let's go back over this again. Titus is my partner in this deal. And then there are these other two guys that have been appointed by the churches And together, we're all in this enterprise together. And because of that, you can know it has integrity. By the way, don't get confused here about the fact that these men are called messengers of the churches. Some students of scripture have seen that this is the Greek word apostolos here. And want to elevate these guys to the same level as the apostles of Christ. There's no merit in doing that. The Greek word that is used there is a word that simply means someone who was officially authorized to be a representative. But here they are representatives of the churches, probably the Macedonian churches, And that is very different from the apostles, capital A, who were personally appointed by Christ to be eyewitnesses of his resurrection. These men are not apostles in that sense. They are simply representatives of the churches. And please don't tell me in our day and time that you think you are an apostle There are no apostles today, capital L, capital A. There may be messengers or representatives, 
in a general sense, but that is far different from the official apostles of Christ. Well, going back to verse 23, notice the very last phrase. They are messengers of the churches, a glory to Christ. What a statement. You know, I wouldn't mind having that on my tombstone. A glory to Christ. That's about as high a compliment as you could ever express. What does it mean? It, it means they bring glory to Christ by how they live, by how they conduct their business, by their integrity, by their obedience to the word of God. Everything about them brings glory to Christ. That's the kind of man you put in charge of the money. Well, I have to wrap this up. I'm tempted to say more, but we need to move on to the last point in our outline, which is integrity through proof of love. Look with me at verse 24. Therefore, because of what is at stake and because of all this need for accountability, openly before the churches, show them the proof of your love and our reason for boasting about you. Here is the call for the Corinthians to get on board with this offering. Paul has assured them that there is complete integrity. So now it is time for them to show all the other churches in a public way that they too love the Lord and are equally part of this Christ-honoring endeavor. Interestingly, the phrase openly before all the churches literally means in the faces of all the churches. In other words, publicly demonstrate your love. Let everybody see it. Show to them the proof of your love. You say you love Christ? Prove it. Prove it. Demonstrate it. Let's see your love on display in a tangible way. Prove your love for the Lord of the church. And notice he says, we've been boasting about you. Don't make our boast to be in vain. We've been telling the other churches how committed you are to Christ. Now it's your turn to show that. So let's bring it up to today. How do we here in America in 2021 need to respond to all of this? Well, first of all, we need to be as committed to financial integrity as Paul was. We need to have safeguards and precautions and limitations in place so people will know with confidence that we are handling money with integrity. And when people give their offerings, they can know that it's been handled properly and in a God-glorifying way. But beyond that, we also need to demonstrate our love for Christ by the way we give. We need to do as these churches did and support the church of Jesus Christ with gracious, generous giving. And so we need to look at our own lives and we need to look at our own practice and we need to ask ourselves, how are we supporting the work of the Lord. How are we giving? Are we giving generously? Are we showing our love through our giving? That's the question. Let's pray together. Father, we pray this morning again that you would help us to understand your principles concerning giving, your principles concerning financial integrity, 
how we are to be about your work, how, to, how we're to raise uh, funds, resources in a Christ-honoring way. Lord, we desire to do that. So Lord, we thank you that you've given to us clear instructions that we don't have to wonder about it, that we can know how to go about it. So Lord, we pray that you would help us in that. And Lord, as always, we pray if there are any who are listening to this broadcast this morning that do not know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, that they would put their faith and trust in Christ alone for salvation. And Lord, we pray that all of us would be faithful to you. And Lord, even on a day when we can't uh, gather together because of the weather, Lord, we know that it is vital for us to be together as a church. We can't be the church unless we are assembling together. And so, Lord, we look forward to being able to do that again next Sunday. And Lord, until that time, we pray that you would help us to be about your work throughout this week. And Lord, we pray that you might bless those efforts. And we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.